Hello and welcome to another episode of Wither the Luniversity, uh, the podcast of the Peerless Review. My guest today uh, is really the, the person whose work um, caught my attention when it comes to climate science. Obviously, I have no training in that era or area, um, but um, her phenomenal work over, over decades um, has put her at the, the front of the, uh, the study of um, climatology and um, peripheral uh, concerns. Um, she has a PhD from the University of Chicago in geophysical sciences, was the former chair of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences from 02 to 13 at Georgia Tech. Um, is still Professor Emerita there. Uh, she left the university due to what she called anti-skeptic bias. Um, and I think this is a quote, uh, the poisonous nature of scientific discourse around human caused global warming. She served on NASA's advisory council um, in earth science subcommittee, um, a member of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Climate Working Group, and most recently co-founder and president of the Climate Forecast Applications Network, or CFAN. And she has a book in press called Climate Uncertainty and Risk, a forthcoming interview very soon with Jordan Peterson. We could spend the rest of the afternoon going on about accolades, but I want to welcome instead Dr. Judith Curry. Judith, welcome. Well, thank you, Adam. It's it's very nice to meet you over Zoom. Yeah. Um, so I asked this of everybody who's on the show, uh, uh, who's who's been in academia uh, at some point or another. And I wonder, how did you how did this path begin for you? How did you get interested in uh, climate science? Narrate for us how you chose that field and, and moved in that direction early on. Well, I guess you have to go back to grade school. I always liked rocks, even though I grew up in Illinois, there's not a lot of geologically interesting things there. Me and my dad would go to the quarry and I would just loved, I just love rocks. And with my birthday money in sixth grade, I bought this very big coffee table book on geology and I poured through it and just loved it. Um, when I was thinking about what to major in in college, you know, I went back to that I said geology, but it seemed too qualitative to me. I thought maybe some physics. So how about geophysics? Okay, so I went to a, a state college university in Illinois of no particular <laughs> reputation. And I ended up um, taking a bunch of courses and really liked the professor in meteorology, atmospheric science. So that's what I focused on, but got a very broad sciencey education as well as liberal arts education. And it was interesting because I went to a second rate university. I was able to take upper level classes in different majors, you know, and still get it, you know, and not get killed <laughs> by the grade. So I, I ended up with a rather interesting um background, broad background. And then I went to graduate school at University of Chicago in geophysical sciences. And I, I wonder, you know, I encountered your name in these these uh, dialogues about climate science and, and uh, the ensuing climate catastrophe. How you kind of entered the university right when that debate was kind of heating up uh, as a professor. Is that right? Well, actually before, so I entered, you know, I got my degree in 82 and it really wasn't until the nineties when it's, you know, heated up and I'm going to say the late nineties. Okay. Um, and it really got hot, you know, around, around 2001 after the third assessment report, you know, it was very fashionable, you know, in the nineties, it was very fashionable to be skeptical about the IPCC. Oh, that's just politics. And the scientists were overconfident and, oh yeah, it's just politics, you know? So, you know, real scientists were a bit snobby about the whole thing and just sort of ignored it and dismissed it. Okay, but then, you know, and it was really, it was really the third assessment report. Um, 
uh, people got really interested. And then I'm part of the story about when it really kicked off around 2005, 2006. This is when, in 2007, that's a period when it really accelerated. Um, you know, this was Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore and the IPCC getting the, um, the Nobel Peace Prize, but a significant something that happened before that that got the public interest. And this was the whole Hurricane Katrina. And I was a co-author on a paper that was published like two weeks after Hurricane Katrina wow. struck about how we had observed from the global you know, tropical cyclone records that we were seeing an increase in the proportion of category four and five hurricanes. And it was tied to the increase in temperature. And we said, it's not inconsistent with global warming. And our main message was, you know, New Orleans, you, you need to be prepared, not just for category threes, but maybe category four and five also. But everybody picked up on the global warming aspect to it. And for the first time, you know, people will say, one degree, two degrees, three degrees, who cares? You know, it changes that much from day to night, from winter to summer, from day to day, who cares? But for the first time, people cared about global warming. If one degree of warming can give us more intense hurricanes, whoa, this is something to watch out about. And, and this started the whole messaging about global warming and extreme weather events. You know, after that, you couldn't have, you know, a heat wave, a flood, a drought, anything, not right. everything would be attributed to fossil fueled warming. So, you know, so it was in the 80s and 90s, it was relatively quiet and you could ignore the whole thing. Um, and then I would say the last 10 years, it's just been post Obama. All, yeah, it, it's all, yeah, it's all ugly politics, just ugly politics. And, you know, the whole. And, this and is, it, it, yeah, go on. This is kind of what drew me to to the climate change debate is the way that every weather event, whether rain, snow, sleet, hail, sun, storms, clear skies, everything, right, wow. was attributed to this in some way and I study rhetoric and it's I started to suspect like it it seems like it's kind of heads I win tails you lose right whatever happens is proof of the climate catastrophe mm -hmm. uh, so you have said and and correct me if I'm misstating your position but I think that your position is that quite you know anthropomorphic climate change is real um and yet the, the, the prospect of climate catastrophe is vastly overstated um, and that the way that the debate has unfolded in scientific circles has undermined your confidence in um, the, the scientific debate and I think the empirical rigor of the whole thing. Is that a, a safe encapsulation of your take? Um, sort of. Okay. Uh, it's it's the IPCC is a big player in this whole thing. That's the and they International started, Panel on Climate Change, right? Yeah. And it's it's a UN panel, and this is the big thing driving all of this, the science behind the whole thing. And very early on, their first report was like 1991, I think. But the the powers that be says we have to seek consensus and they framed it very narrowly. Um, human caused climate change, dangerous climate change. So nobody was looking at any other causes. You know, natural variability was ignored. And if there was any uh, positive benefits to warming, no, nobody wanted to look at that either. I mean, it was all folk, very narrow framing and they're trying to seek consensus. And so all of the national funding, you know, research funding agencies were trying to support this and they would frame their announcements of opportunity in the context of dangerous human caused climate change. So if anybody wanted funding, there was no point to working on anything else. Okay. And, and so that, that really funneled the research in a certain direction. And the only people were 
that were challenging this for the most part were, were senior people who were past the, the need for funding, who had a bigger perspective, who could financially afford to retire or were already retired. These were the only people speaking up. Okay, and then people said, oh, well, those are people who are past it. They haven't read the literature. Well, that's not true. Or they were the only ones who weren't gonna be harmed by peer evaluations, if you will. You know, that there's so much positive feedback in the academic ecosystem. Um, universities get all sorts of publicity for their professors touting their latest, you know, juicing it up and touting their latest paper. You won't be able to grow grapes in California. There goes the wine industry, you know, all, all these kind of things. Um, they attract a lot of funding. So, you know, the university administrators like it. Um, people got control, you know, with this perspective, were the ones that are recognized by the professional societies. They see the funding. They, you know, th these are the people who get also seats at the big policy tables. Yes. You know, get invited for a congressional testimony and lucrative consultancies and everything. And, you know, the professional society, the people who, became officers in professional societies and editors of journals. I mean, they got those positions because they had that perspective and, and you got this huge big gatekeeping ecosystem in place. So there's this social contract between the policymakers, the funding agencies and the scientists, you know, just to keep this thing rolling. Um, and, you know, then the media people and the NGOs hop on board and their whole business model and their whole professional identity gets wrapped up in this. And you've got all these positive feedbacks. This is the real positive feedback in the climate system. Um, you know, it's a, it's a social feedback system that is accelerating this. And then politicians make their reputation on this issue and on and on it goes. So what was the response you're sort of labeled as a skeptic. Um, I'm not sure it's an accurate uh, label, um, but either way, I wonder the extent to which colleagues in your discipline at Georgia Tech and elsewhere, I mean, socially, how did this play out for you? Did you feel like you were increasingly isolated in terms of invitations to serve in, in various ways within your field and things like this? Or was it cordial the way that a healthy intellectual environment should be? Okay, For, first, you know, skepticism is one of the norms of science. You right. Know, we should always challenge things. And, you know, my job as a science is to continually evaluate the data, question the assumptions, challenge the conclusions. I mean, that's my job as a scientist. That's anybody's job. It's not to recite consensus talking points. Okay, so... When I started, it was really the, you're familiar with Climate Gate. This was the- Yes, uh, yes. Okay. Hide the decline. The, <laughs> 2009, the unauthorized release of emails from the University of East Anglia. There's yes. a lot of people who were um, involved in the IPCC, all the hockey stick stuff, things like that. And it reflected- and people said, well, the science is still there and the science doesn't change. But what it did is it, it to me, just reflected institutionalized behavior that was violating the basic norms of science. Okay, and this is what I was calling out. Is it behavior we have to do better? Um, so I started criticizing, I, I didn't call people out by name, but I criticized this behavior criticize the IPCC for not enforcing conflict of interest, for not you know, having brought enough people, for not paying attention to uncertainty. <clears throat> so it was these statements that got me branded. Okay, okay, what really people were unhappy about when I started talking like that, but they didn't start calling me a denier or skeptic or anything like that. That all changed in 2011. I wrote an article on the hockey stick hiding the decline, Michael Mann. And I won't go into the details of it, but Michael Mann was displeased. 
as far as I can tell, he's a moron who can't handle any criticism at all. But oh, oh well, yeah, well, we can get into that later if you want. That is a very interesting case. Um, but then he started calling me me a denier and anti-science and all this kind of stuff. And then that picked up, oh my gosh, finally, we, we didn't know what to do about the Judith Curry problem. <laughs> Just <laughs> call her a denier, throw, throw her over into that other side and you know then we don't have to worry about her and see if you can find some oil money to tar her with too and then she's dead um so <laughs> but it picked up in the media um in terms of actual science you know climate scientists with any professional standing they would never call me a denier or skeptic right they wouldn't they know how i think and they know what i write OK, and, and it's legitimate. They may not like it. They may not agree with it, but they don't call me a denier or any nasty names. That's reserved for Michael Mann and a few activists, scientists and fringe areas who probably never read any of my papers. So I'm not widely regarded, even even OK, even through that period up until my retired retirement, I was invited to give a lot of talks. People wanted to hear what I had to say. So that was never a problem. I could get my papers published through that period. I was even getting invited to submit um, some papers. Um, so that wasn't a problem. Um, funding, I wasn't really applying for funding in that general area because I knew it was hopeless. I was doing satellite remote sensing or other stuff that I knew I could easily get funded. So I wasn't trying to get funded in that area. Um, the problem was I had a few Michael Mann colleagues in my department who were out to get me. Okay, and they started sabotaging me with the dean, who was actually the stepfather of one of those scientists. I mean, that was a crazy conflict of interest. Um, one who had a line to the provost, we have to get rid of her, you know, this, that, and the other. And things became very uncomfortable for me at Georgia Tech. They wanted me to step down as chair. I knew I had no hope of getting another administration, even though I had quite some talents in university administration, if I say so myself. But, you know, I was dead in the water at Georgia Tech. So I could have hung on and just sucked up my big salary. I said, well, I really want to move out west. Why don't I look for jobs? I'm always getting these queries from headhunters. You know, well, there's a position here. You look like you'd be a good candidate. So I applied for a few of them big ones, you know, like vice provost kind of positions, director of institute, that kind of thing. Um, and I got some interviews and I didn't get any offers. And the feedback from the headhunters was, look, you're a fantastic candidate. You look great on paper. You wrote, you know, an amazing sort of vision statement and you interviewed very well, but here's what killed you. The minute you Googled Judith Curry, Judith Curry, science misinformer. Judith Curry turns on her colleagues. Judith Curry, denier. You know, at the time, my, my whole Google profile, if you search now, it's not that bad. But how could you present my case to the higher administration? And then they Google me and they see all this stuff. He said, you know, that, that absolutely killed you. So this is, you know, the Michael Mann instigated stuff that was picked up, you know, by all the little lower level acolytes and ad activists and whatever. And I got, you know, so my, so I still had the option, you know, if they want to get rid of me, it's going to take them some time. In the meantime, I can sit around and suck up my big salary. But I said, no, um, that's not what I want to do. That's not who I am. And so I said, I want to move out West anyway. I'm out of here. And I'm doing fine. I'm happy <laughs> doing a lot of great things, interesting things, fun things, important things. And it was the best decision I ever made. I wish I would have done it earlier, but I was in a better financial position to do it when I did. So that's so still the saga. <laughs> you left 10 years ago now, and I'm sure um, that you- Actually, six years ago. In, in, I, I retired January 1st, 2017. Okay. I stepped out as chair in 2013. Okay. 
All right. Yeah. So either way, you kind of um, stepped down, uh, retired before the Great Awakening. Do you see any signs that uh, these same sort of groupthink impulses and the vengeful turn in uh, academic life have accelerated since you left, or is it more or less the same? Oh, it's much worse. <laughs> it's accelerating um, with all of the... Um... I mean, we had to write, you know, any job candidate had to write a token diversity statement. Oh, you know, I, if you're a female, it was easy. Oh, I gave a talk at some third grade class. It was more outreachy diversity kind of thing. And it was pretty easy. But now at this point, I mean, it's very serious. I mean, people don't get hired. Over, you know, outstanding scholars don't get hired over this stuff. It, it's becoming predominant and it's and and it's just not helpful i mean you want a, a culture of inclusion but you don't some of this stuff is way over the top and the, the more the worst thing and i don't hear so much talk about the whole safe space thing you do violence to me by saying that because i you disagree with me and all that kind of stuff it, it's like what what kind of young adults <laughs> are we raising here you know these victims it, it's just you know it's this whole cult of victim and it's all this categorization you know why can't people just be people and accept other people as people it doesn't seem to work you know you know the pronouns and on and on it goes you know it, it's all so much identity based rather than you know superficial identity based rather than who you are in your heart and your mind um which is not a good thing for, <laughs> for humanity, not to mention universities. It's something that I struggle with because I am 44 years old. Um, I'm full professor now, so I don't need to worry about another promotion. But also, you know, a simple Google search of me will, in, in the current political environment, disqualify me for any other English department in the country, more or less. <laughs> um, and so it's kind of like, I'm kind of at this point where I have to ask myself, can I do 20 more years of this or should I do something else? You know, um, cause well, I don't see that it's going to get better. Well, start, start a path. Okay. Roger Pilkey Jr. is an example here. I think he's a little bit older than you are, but he's starting, he started a sub stack and mm -hmm. people are subscribing, not enough for him to but it's enough for him to pay for a research assistant. <laughs> you know, it's enough for him to pay for a month of his summer salary. And some people, you know, the sub stack thing can take off and you can actually may not provide a living wage, but it's a way of ramping up into something else. Yes. As you, it gives you a little bit of a safety net, which allows you to not be so circumspect in yes. your academic profile. Um, like my, my, it's not why I started the company, um, as sort of a backstop, but, you know, it, the fact that I had the company as a backup. You're talking about CFAN now. CFAN, yeah, my company, you know, as a backup. Well, you know, if, if things really go south and I end up leaving the university or getting kicked out, you know, I have a backup in place. Um, it doesn't quite replace my income, but at least it's something that gives me professional identity and I have a team and whatever. It, it seemed like, you know, the, the, this was my sort of, <laughs> at the time I regarded it as my insurance policy um, for my academic career that I was increasingly allowing to become precarious. So tell us a little bit about the aims of CFAN and, and uh, how this project has unfolded as it's ramped up. Well, okay. We started in 2006 with a contract from USAID and CARES, which for flood forecasting in Bangladesh, it's a humanitarian thing. You know, if you give them a week's notice, they have time. I mean, Okay, we say, well, when we evacuate, we hop in our car and off we go. <laughs> well, when, when a farmer in Bangladesh has to evacuate, it's him, his family, and their cows and, and whatever possessions they can carry. But 
if they carry their seeds and they carry their cows, you know, they're, then they can go back and they have something to start with. If they lose all that, then they have to take out more loans and this is relentlessly impoverishing. So we, we did a um, technology transfer to a group, a multi national group in South Asia who took over that. And so that, that was what started us. Okay, so, and, and then our next project was actually um, petroleum company in Houston. I think you have a few there. And, <laughs> <laughs> and they were mainly interested in, um, this was following Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Rita and all the crazy natural gas supply and price spikes and everything. And natural gas trading got started. And they said, well, if we can get a forecast that's like two days ahead of the National Hurricane Center, we can make a killing in natural gas trading. And we can, you know, do better in terms of natural gas marketing and sales. Okay, so we took on that challenge and rather brilliant, brilliantly, <laughs> we were able to do that. And we, we, we made them a lot of money in 2007 with Hurricane Dean, I don't know if you were in Houston back then, but it was predicted to go to Houston. No, it's going to go to Mexico. You guys don't need to worry about it. And so they acted on that and they were good. And then the next year with, with Hurricane Ike, you know, we predicted that well in advance. And so this the company was able to book all the hotel rooms inland so they could have business continuity. And they had that all established before anybody else knew it was coming. So, you know, that was our, our second contract. But I mean, sort of that's how we got started, you know, slowly contract by contract, doing a lot of different things. Uh, we started selling our forecasts to other major weather service providers. I, I couldn't do all the, the sales and marketing. It was easier just to give it to somebody else to license. And so we did some of that. And then we got some some contracts, electric utilities, the insurance sector, um, those are and energy traders. Those remain our, our big segments. We have another project in South Asia. This one is for farmers. We're doing precision agriculture um, with farmers, coffee farmers in Karnataka, India, and cotton and other farmers in Punjab, Pakistan. And we're working with a um, NGO, Precision Agriculture, who is the intermediary. And this is pretty exciting. We're in the second year of that project. Um, on the climate side of things, that part of the business started picking up about five years ago. Um, at first, I was just helping people with lawsuits, helping them interpret what they were facing, <laughs> you know, um, helping them with questions for witnesses. I was just advising people that were involved in lawsuits. Now I'm more actively involved in lawsuits, but that's not the major part of where I see this going. It, it's really looking at, we've developed a way of, of formulating regional scenarios out to 2050 that includes both natural variability and human caused warming. And we focus on statistics of extreme weather events. So um, a lot of people are interested in that, um, in the energy sector, in the insurance sector, some local governments, municipalities. So we're doing more of those kind of projects, but our bread and butter is really what I would say, 15 day forecasts for um, hurricanes. Oh, renewable energy where, you know, wind forecasts, solar power forecasts, uh, and, and our claim to fame is doing well at longer time horizons. Um, everybody has a good three or four day forecast, but we go out two, three, four weeks wow. um, with, with useful skill. Um, so that's the kind of things that I'm doing with the company. And there's a lot of research involved. There's a lot of research to operations. Um, and then there's a lot of um, listening to people and trying to come up with new ideas. I talk to a lot of other startup companies in different areas. Um, 
not weather and climate, but they, they, they see a weather or climate angle and trying to figure out how to integrate that into their business. So I like to, I like talking with these companies because it helps me generate new ideas about what's out there and how weather and climate information can play a role. So, uh, you know, out of 10 of those conversations, I may have two follow-ups. Okay, and one of them may turn into something where we actually do something, whether or not we make money. But it, it's worth um, listening and engaging with all these people so I can try to develop a network and a framework for figuring out all the different ways that weather and climate information can be used. Hmm. So as we're talking about forecasts, this might be a good time to talk about um, NCA4, which I have right here, that is the the uh, the National Climate Assessment of the U.S. Global Change Research Program. I've written a little bit on this, and, and one of the things that shocks me a lot when I read this report is if you dig into the front matter, as I'm sure you're aware, they have a section where they, they say... Um, what the criteria are in terms of the confidence related to their projections. They don't like to call them predictions, um, but their projections. Um, and if I look at that page where they give us that criteria for a high confidence prediction, for them to make what they call a high confidence prediction, they say there needs to be moderate evidence some consistency in the research that methods may vary and or documentation may be limited and that there needs to be a quote, medium consensus. And I guess I just wanted to ask you, why do we have medium evidence and a moderate consensus required for a high confidence projection? Well, that the same thing struck me also. I even wrote a blog post on it and I include a few paragraphs in my book because it's really astonishing. It It's A, it's misleading, okay? And B, it just reflects a lower level of evidence that's required in this field, you know, to draw highly confidence conclusions. And um, it's, it's all... <clears throat> If there weren't any policymakers paying attention to this, there would be no point to it. But the whole rationale is speaking consensus to power that they think this is the way to go, that they, they lack an understanding of politics and real decision making, and that they're pushing this whole consensus to power thing. And it, it's just a really mis big mistake to take that tack for an exceptionally complex, wicked problem like climate change. So it's um, it reflects extremely poorly on the discipline of climate science. And you know the NCA4, okay, there's a few decent sections in the report where they had de decent co-authors, people that I could look at and say, yeah, those are the right people to write the name, this chapter. There are other ones, people like, why on earth was that person selected? And who on earth is that person? You know, these people were, you know, completely wrong for writing those sections. I don't know how those assignments were made. And this is, you know, a very, very weak, weak cousin compared to the IPCC reports. There's plenty to criticize about the IPCC reports, but it's far, far more scientific and professionally done than the NCA report. I spent part of yesterday afternoon scouring the hundreds of names in NCA4 to see if I could find okay. Judith Curry, and it was curiously absent. Um, oh, okay. Well, I, I don't accept, not that they've invited me, but I don't accept invitations to write group articles or to sign my name to petitions or statements. I only sign things that either I write myself or that I agree with 110%. I don't want my name on something that I know I'm going to disagree with most, even though I could maybe make a part of it a little bit better. But no, just not going there. 
So on the question of confidence, and, and this is, as I said, my interest in the climate change documents, um, it feels to me like a rhetorical sleight of hand. It, it feels to me like a way to make it look like they're very, very confident in something that ultimately they're not that confident about. Um, and this is written all over the report in yeah. a lot of different ways, just in terms of uh, what is it? The, is it the RC, you know? Um, oh, RCP 8.5. Yeah. Oh, yes. Gosh. Like they, they give you two scenarios, I think RCP 8.5 and RCP 5 or 4.5. And it's like, well, why those two, which they acknowledge up front are both high end, you know, um, um, standards. It's all about the, you know, the, the competence thing is the tip of the iceberg in terms of rhetorical tricks. I'm going to lay a few <laughs> more out on there. Okay. The definition of climate change according to the UN framework is human caused climate change associated with anthropogenic emissions. Then they say, oh, and then there's natural climate variability associated with the sun and whatever. But whenever anybody talks about climate change, they're basically, there's the inference that all of, clim all of climate change is human caused this sort of rhetorical trick of relabeling climate change to be just human caused climate change. Okay, there's, an, there's another trick and this one's a little bit trickier, but there's been a conflation fallacy um, and this goes back to the extreme weather events. I mean, th there, there's two separate risk types from climate change. One is the slow creep of warming. This is associated with the slow creep of sea level rise, maybe a long-term change in drought or something like that. And then there's the emergency risk associated with extreme weather events. Okay. And so they use the, and, and of course the, the solution to the slow creep people claim is to eliminate fossil fuel emissions. Okay, the solution to emergency risk is regional, uh, reduce local vulnerability type of thing. Well, they conflate these two risks so that every extreme weather event is used to emphasize the need for rapid reductions in fossil fuel emissions. So there's this conflation fallacy that's going on. So it's, okay, the, the latest one is the horrendous floods in New Zealand. I mean, they really are huge and they really are record-breaking. Have anything to do with global warming? No, it's a weird circulation pattern in the Southern hemisphere, it happens. Okay, but they're saying, oh, we, we have to, you know, we have to stop fossil fuel emissions before this gets any worse. You know, even if we were to stop fossil fuel emissions, you probably wouldn't notice any difference in extreme weather events. And if you did, it probably wouldn't be until the 21st century, uh, 22nd century. So that's another sort of rhetorical. So let me, as a, as a lay person, tell me what I have wrong here. Um, I look at something like these confidence standards and, and the sleight of hand there, and I understand what they're trying to do is make themselves more convincing to convince the public that this is a real problem. But when I see the sleight of hand, I say that actually makes it less convincing to me that you have to play these tricks. And then on top of that, I think if the problem is as severe as some of the experts say, right, then kind of we're already screwed because the mitigation measures that would be, have to take place would be so profound Right. And we, we'd have to do it so immediately that we, we can't stop it if it's as bad as they say anyways. So is is that an uninformed perspective on my part? Uh, no, it's good. You know, if they're right and there's something, you know, it's going to be really, really bad. The last thing we want to do is cripple our our energy system. So we're even more vulnerable to whatever horrors this warmer climate might bring. So, so that's like sort of counterproductive. And, you know, the speed at which you can do this, I mean, is many, many decades. 
and exactly what we should be doing in that regard is the subject of great debate. But so many states in the US, I was on a call yesterday. This is the New York system, electric system reliability thing. Um, and the concern, you know, that they're going to all wind solar with battery backup and they import some hydro from Canada. And they're trying to figure out, you know, what is with extreme weather and crazy weather and wind droughts and whatever, what would the system have to look like in order to survive all that? And, and they're completely flying blind. And I'm talking to the people with a clue. These are the engineers with the electric utilities, not the politicians who are really clueless. And, you know, all of these political mandates are coming down. The the engineers either say no way or are completely clueless as to what they're facing. And, you know, th this is what we're, what's going on. And I'm pretty sure I lost track of the last part of your question, which was interesting, but. Um, well, it's just that, uh, that we probably like, if it's as dire as they're saying, oh, it's probably oh, too late to act. Yeah, it is. Here's what I was going to say. Are you familiar with Paul Slovic's work on perception of risk? This is no. something you want to look at and I'll send it to you. But, you know, there's a couple and, and there's a section in my book, you know, if it's man-made versus natural, you perceive it differently. If it's an everyday risk versus a rare risk, if it's, you know, all these different things is risk pairs, one of them doesn't seem so bad. You know, people, you know, the biggest risk they face is probably from driving their car and from eating too much, <laughs> you know, but they, they think things like nuclear power plants and all sorts of other things are the really big risks. You know, it's just people, perceptions is weird. And I think this is a, as a rhetorician, this is a good, because it affects how, and you can see, and I'll send you the relevant section of my book on this because you can see how this plays out into how people have decided to communicate about climate change. One of the thing is equitable risk versus asymmetric risk. You know, the poor people and undeveloped countries and you know how, how they play on all these things in the communication of climate risk, playing yes. to people's fears. Um, well, it so, seems so, you you said that it's many decades. Like, if, if we do it right, like if we took the mitigation efforts, best case scenario, it's many decades. But it seems like China and India don't want to play the game, right? And so, well, the, 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 they have enough. Set, okay, the, the, this is a something that only affluent countries can do. I mean, the other ones are trying to survive or trying to, you know, are under pressure from their people for economic development and whatever. Right, it's a to luxury. create a middle class. Right. And it's a luxury for the richer European countries and Canada, New Zealand and, you know, these places. And the U.S. is interesting because you have a, a very different reactions among the different states. Um, so it's a microcosm of, of many things in the world where some of the more affluent, you know, New York and California are rushing to be leaders in this. And then some of the more. And meanwhile, the, the population of California bleeds <laughs> to Texas and the co population of my native state of New York bleeds to Florida. Right. Exactly. They're just. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, you know, it's something that doesn't make sense. And and the African countries, this is, this is where the real travesty is. Africa, I mean, they're not even trying to make it to middle class. They're just trying to survive. Okay. And they, they desperately need energy, electricity, and whatever. And the they can't get any loans from any international banks because of European investors. No, no, we can't fund any more fossil fuel stuff. And so now they're figuring out how to pay for it themselves. Kenya, they're building a, a gas pipeline, okay, with their own money, you know, and they're getting all sorts of blowback from the UN and Europe, this, that, and the other. And they're basically saying F off <laughs> as they should. Um, and But the worst thing is like Uganda and places like that, they have, fossil fuel resources, but they can't afford to do anything with them. They, so they export them to Europe. So, so, so the hypocrisy, the right. hypocrisy is mind blowing. 
It's unbelievable. So let me ask you this. This is kind of about the academic culture of science more broadly. It sounds you've touched on throughout our conversation various incentives and disincentives in the form of research funding, tenure and promotion, um, to invitations to talk, uh, in the you know um, external work in terms of um, employability. That there's all these different incentives that are placed on the scale that kind of distort the process of consensus making. This is especially clear that this has occurred around climate change. But would you say that it poisons the prospects of scientific consensus across the board that in it other okay. unrelated topics? Okay, let's take a stick step back. Um, tr consensus, we need to talk about consensus a little bit more philosophically here. Okay, let's say the fact that the Earth circles the sun. Nobody questions that. You never talk about the consensus of the Earth circling the sun um, or the fact that the oxygen molecule is heavier than the hydrogen molecule. You never talk about the consensus. I mean, it's a fact. Everybody knows it. Nobody questions it. Consensus comes into play. And the word, you never hear, if it's policy relevant, um, the, the most, in, in the, the medical field, they use consensus committees to decide what drugs are going to be insured for what disease and whatever. And that's a decision has to be made and there has to be agreement. But that doesn't mean it's scientifically right. <laughs> okay. It's just for purposes of insurance, a decision has to be made. So the medical consensus committees, okay, they make sense. But for a field at the knowledge frontier, where, which climate science is certainly one. It's a young field, it's an immature field. The idea of consensus makes no sense. Science proceeds perfectly well without with this disagreement, multiple hypotheses, and trying to manufacture consensus, um, it's done for two reasons. One, it may be in for, you know, they may be asked by politicians, which was the case for the IPCC. You know, we need a consensus. They should have resisted and say, here's the arguments for and against, and he, you know, here's what we don't know. Um, that's a better way to do it, but that's not the way they went. Um, so the other sounds... one... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. And then the other one is, is within subfields, even without politicians, you get gatekeeping editors and senior people in the field who are protecting their reputation and whatever, and claim a consensus, you know, for, for various careerism, personal, whatever reasons they manage to, people that are high up in the power structure manage to get the, it can be in physics, it can be in any field. Um, so, and- It, it sounds like what you're saying then is- Consensus is a disease, you don't need it in science. It sounds like what you're saying is, is as soon as a discourse uh, uh, arises related to consensus, you've already kind of, that's the evidence that there is some dimension of politicization happening. Uh, yeah, whether it's raw politics or academic politics. Okay. So the NGOs, you've talked a little bit about them. Do they, they are very eager, especially since 2020, to advance the climate agenda. Do you believe that they believe the alarmist narrative or do you believe that that the climate agenda is a means to other ends and that that well, is a, why? Go ahead. There, there, there's a spectrum, but you have to understand that very few of these people have any significant understanding of climate dynamics. You know, it's an issue. It chimes in with their politics. It chime, chimes in with their need to be relevant or an activist or whatever. Um, in it's trendy in colleges, you know, amongst peer. There's peer pressure. There's, you know, all sorts of factors in play that make this. You know, of the more, you know, the older, more established. Um, Enviro advocacy groups, you know, Greenpeace, Sierra Club, all these kind of things. Um, and they're sort of conflicted on the climate change issue because a lot of what's being proposed in the name of 
climate change mitigation is anti <laughs> to the reg to the more traditional environmental agenda. So they're not exceptional activists on this. You've got all these, you know, Extinction Rebellion and all these new groups that have popped up that are that are out there, um, that are way out there, and they haven't. A they really haven't a clue. I mean, and it's part of their identity. They're getting money, big donors. I mean, some of the donors behind this stuff, uh, Pauline Getty of the Getty Fortune, Rockefellers, even one of the Kennedys, pumping millions and millions into these crazy groups like Just Stop Oil, Extinction Rebellion, and all that kind of thing. I mean, like, where you know, what is that about? I could, I, I can't tell you what's going on in their head. Um, maybe it's, it's chic in certain New York circles. I don't know. I don't I know. Think what that, I think it's a, it's a vehicle for stealth socialism. I mean, because this sort of top-down managed economy managed through public-private partnerships, right, in practice would look a whole lot like a, a state-controlled marketplace um and and so i think that at least and i realize that this sounds kind of conspiratorial but i think that there are entities that for whom they realize hey this can help us get what we've always wanted um, oh yeah oh for sure that that goes back to the the early history uh, you know of the un environmental program in the 80s you know and this is what i can't remember the guys the guy's name back then but they they were didn't like capitalism, hated oil companies, world government, all this kind of thing. And they latched on to climate change as, um, as a vehicle for this. It, it turned out to be the perfect vehicle because it's such an amorphous thing. You can blame pretty much anything on climate. So yeah, that, there's a that, that kind of agenda. But even if you didn't start out with that agenda and you get working for one of these groups or whatever, your, your income, your professional identity, your personal identity is all wrapped up in this. Okay, so even if something comes along, like, like let's say they were put in a room with me for eight hours, you know, and I really explained to them, and, and even if they were really convinced, I mean, they, they don't want to jeopardize their personal identity, their professional identity, their income, you know, it's and it's sort of locked in. Friendships, yeah, friendships. too. Oh, you know? yeah, the network. It's it's a very tribal thing. A very tribal thing. There's a lot wow. of dinner invitations to be lost. Yeah. So it's a complex, the, the social dynamics of all this within the university, within the broader public, very complex. It seems to me that the, the subject of the COVID-19 vaccine is something where we've kind of had this omerta or code of silence around any scientific questioning also, that it must be it, it's safe okay. and effective, period. Yeah, I, I include a lot of parallels in my book between the climate change and the COVID-19. Uh, speaking of consensus, so back in, and this was in what, April of 2020, right in the very beginning, there were two papers published, one in, I think, Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine, where multiple big time authors said it's absolutely natural. You know, people are saying it's man-made, it's conspiracy theory, blah, 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 blah. And they're, you know, prejudiced against China and, you know, Trump derangement syndrome and all this really? kind of stuff. And it, it got published and, and people bought it. You know, there was anybody who said otherwise got canceled from Twitter, um, from Facebook, were marginalized at their universities. It was a very bad situation. And it held up for about a year. And then a few investigative reporters found all sorts of conflict of interest. These guys were funding the research in the Wuhan lab and all sorts of ugly things going on. And Fauci trying to kill this and Francis Collins of the National Institute for Health trying to kill this lab origin thing. Um, you know, it was very, very ugly. And then this came out and then all of a sudden there was a dam burst of all people saying, of course, we don't know, <laughs> you know, very likely could be caused by the lab. But, but the point is from within that community, those people were so powerful 
anybody within that community knew that if they came out against it, they'd never get another grant proposal funded. <laughs> and the power that these people held over their career, people were afraid to speak up. And once the dam broke, you know, everybody spoke up. But this false consensus, I mean, that we had no, we didn't have much of a clue in April, frankly, about what was going on. And for this overwhelming consensus to be portrayed was crazy. <laughs> and, but the fact that it persisted for a year without serious challenge just shows how <clears throat> bad and strong the pressures are to keep everybody in line in academia. And it was, uh, you know, independent people and, this is another thing that raised the red flag for me is uh, how rapidly COVID-19 uh, was connected to climate change. The Lancet and uh, their joint panel with the UN, they state very explicitly in the opening pages of that, that climate change is the cause of the COVID-19 pandemic. Because obviously, if climate change wasn't so bad, those men in China never would have had to go so far into the forest to get the pangolin. Um, and the pangolin, because of deforestation, would have never wandered out looking for, for shelter, and we would have never had COVID-19. I mean, they, uh, I'm sort of, you know, coloring it, but that's what they say. Um, no, and no. that was a red flag for me that doesn't it just fit so nicely into place, you know? A, a few additional dimensions to that. Okay, so in 2018, the World Health Organization said climate change is the biggest risk to human health the world is facing in the 21st century. Ha, ha, ha. Okay. <laughs> and so the fact that they were paying more attention to climate change than pandemics right. uh, has to be part of the reason we were ill-prepared. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic point. <laughs> I, I, I know. Um, I had other things I was going to say about COVID, but they've evaporated at the moment. Uh, but I would I would love to hear them, but I mean, it really is crazy. And as somebody who is not a scientist, I worry. It's like, geez, we're I I do believe the lab leak theory. I think that it from from the sources that I've read, I think it probably came from a lab. That said, I'm not an expert, but it seems to me we were very fortunate in getting a COVID nineteen and not a really virulent disease. And given that gain of function research seems to have slowed not a bit, right? Uh, I, I worry that we'll have future pandemics of this sort. And next time we might not be so lucky in terms of the bug that we get. <laughs> well, did you see there's some email leak from a Pfizer employee about yes. how they were trying, <laughs> they were trying to cook up some some new variants so they could, you know, increase interest again in the vaccine. <laughs> I mean, this is just sick. It's we have sick. the elites we deserve. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. Um, well, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I could chat with you all day, but um, the conversation has been fascinating. Your work has inspired me as a person who uh, barely passed college geology. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm glad that there are people like you out there who are continuing this work and who really don't give a wit about what the people in the faculty lounge or um, or the NGO lounge, if they have those things, have to say about uh, what you think. Um, Judith Curry, her, her new book, uh, Climate Uncertainty and Risk, you know when it'll be out? It's in press right now. When's it coming out? Um, in June. Uh, fantastic. Well, I will look forward to reading that. In fact, I might mail you a copy when I buy it so that you can sign it for me. Um, Dr. <laughs> Judith Curry, thank you very much. It's been okay. my pleasure. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah.